as you get older, you have to have mental stimulation. And when I took the time off from my first business, I'm telling you my brain went to mush. It took me about a year to get my brain back. Wow. So I want to keep working and I want to keep having purpose and focus. And by working the 20 hours a week and having the foundation as my ultimate purpose and my goal, it keeps me focused and motivated every day. Welcome back, everybody, to the Mind Your Own Business podcast. Today, we have the honor of speaking with my good friend, Mike Seidel. Mike is a well-rounded entrepreneur. Uh, he's also a very, very active philanthropist in many ways, and we're excited to have him on the show today. Mike, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. Hey, man. I appreciate you having me on. This is cool. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to have you on. We just saw each other a few months ago in Cleveland, not even a few months ago. And this this podcast episode is going to be coming out just before Christmas. So it'll be coming out, I believe, on the 22nd or something like that. So that's kind of where we are in, in space and time, you know, depending on what, what plane of time existence you live on. But Mike, let's get into it a little bit. Tell us like a little bit about who you are and your background and, and be boastful, right? Don't be shy, man. I know you're not. Gee, okay. That's a lot to unpack. I like to be active. So let me see. My background is I grew up in uh, Massachusetts. I lived about uh, 45, 50 miles south of Boston. Grew up in an area where about 45 years ago, heroin was a problem. So I speak with my family that still lives there. And we kind of laugh that now they think it's a national problem mm. um, from that perspective. And uh, we didn't have Narcan back then. So we lost a lot of people. I could name 15 or 20 people that I grew up with that are dead in jail or have been in jail. I'm luckily, lucky to enough have gotten out. I saw some things that I wanted to do and I didn't want to live like that. So uh, moved out, went to school at NYU and then started my first business when I was uh, 23 years old. What uh, kind of business was, was it? Yeah, that was uh, medical alert systems. I was on the front end of that. Push a button, get an ambulance. Yeah, I had a partner with that. We got a postcard in the mail for somebody who was selling them. And uh, it was actually a franchise that was not really a franchise because the FTC got involved and shut them down. But we were already up and running. So we found somebody to make our equipment and we found somebody to monitor the equipment because, wow. again, we were going. And uh, so hold on, ahead. hold on, hold on, slow down, slow down. You glossed over the real quick part that you were 23 years old. Uh, and, and you also glossed over the fact that you're like, hey, I just got a postcard in the mail for this thing. I'm just going to start a business around this postcard really quick. <laughs> so what gave you the real idea like what was the spark for for that like what why okay i'll go back slightly when i got out of college i worked at a facility for sexual abused kids for a couple of years as a residential counselor i worked in a group home for mentally retarded men and i actually ran the group home and i worked in a psych hospital on the alcohol and drug treatment services unit so adts wow. the guy who became my business partner worked with me as a residential counselor in the same cottage for the kids. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And part of it was, was necessary because this and this don't always work together. And that's not conducive to working for somebody. So I have no problem with expressing my opinions to authority and authority doesn't always like that. So I became an entrepreneur partially because it's what I wanted to do and partially because I would have gotten fired. If yeah. I was working for the people. So my, my guy who became my business partner knew I wanted to get into business. He got a postcard in the mail that said, hey, I got this thing selling franchises for medical alert systems. You said you wanted to do a business. I think I'd like to try it. What do you say we give it a shot? So we went to their facility in New Jersey. Uh, we got two days of training and came back and our first office was an answering machine in my partner's mother's basement on her dryer and that was it <laughs> we were and we had a post office box we were so <laughs> excited that we actually had a phone actually yeah. we didn't have a phone it was just the answering machine <laughs> so you so, couldn't even answer it if it rang <laughs> nope because back then they were modular they were plug-in so yeah. you only had one plug and that was it and we couldn't afford the phone anyway I had to actually move back into my mother's. He moved back into his mother's. Wow. And uh, yeah, we just went 
it, it was one customer at a time. And what we learned to do was we learned like it's all a step-by-step -step process. So we found out where all the elderly complex, complexes were in the state of Massachusetts. Back then, you didn't have Google. This is going back to uh, 1987, prehistoric times. Pre yeah, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Exactly. So they had what was called the cold directory. And the cold directories would tell you who lived in an address. So we, went, we found out that the Boston Public Library had a business section that had the cold directories for the whole state. So we would go there, make photocopies, which was illegal because it says don't photocopy this stuff. And then we would go back to the office and I would use the phone at my mother's house and he was to use the phone at his house. And we were just calling the elderly who lived in these complexes to let them know that it was paid for by the state of Massachusetts if they were Medicaid eligible. Wow. And that was it. We made up a document and we sent it to their doctor. And that's, that's how we started. Wow. Uh, and we would do, when we were done, we had several thousand customers in 15 states and we got bought by a public company. Okay. They actually, this is a funny story. They contacted us about purchasing and my partner and I were done with our run with each other. And it was just time to go our separate ways. We had 10 years and we had grown different ways, et cetera. He was sales, I was operations. Those don't always mix. So they came to us and they made an offer. Well, they made an offer by phone. And this was phones and faxes and so on. So they made an offer. We felt that the offer was good enough to have them come in and negotiate. So when they sat down, uh, we talked for probably about a half hour and they made their next offer. Well, in negotiation, you know that they're just, they're a public company. They're thinking they're talking to two dumb kids and they're going to lowball us. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing is when they made the offer, my partner looked at me and I looked at him and my partner said, you know, that's not the exact number that we were thinking about. And we're kind of caught off guard by it. We're not sure we can accept it. We're going to need to go to my office and we're just going to need, you know, a little time out. You guys can take a break, bathroom break, et cetera. We went into his office. Now, at this point, we weren't talking too much. Okay. We actually hugged when oh. we realized how much money it was and that this was only their second offer and we knew we had somewhere to go. <laughs> That's awesome. We, in theory, could have just taken that and been fine. Yeah. Um, but, of course, we're going to we're going to go yeah. until, you know, to their point of pain and a little bit beyond. Yeah. So, we know they we knew they had just done a stock offering. They had raised X amount of dollars and we knew they had money to spend and they contacted us. So yeah. they were the ones who wanted it. That's so, amazing. So a couple more rounds of negotiations. You guys struck a deal. Yep. And at that at that point, you were 33, right? So this was what, 1997? Yep, 1998 actually. Just February of 98. February of 98. Yeah. Uh, just before the dot com bubble was starting to to pop. And, and so you sold to them, right? To this public company. Yep. And we, I couldn't decide what I wanted to do next was sitting around my house, uh, worked with them for about three months, uh, to get things up and running so they could understand our systems. And Lois and I were at a RV show with some friends and we decided to buy an RV. Okay. We put all of our stuff in storage and sold our house and drove around the U.S. for 16 months in a motorhome. 16 months. 16 months. Between the motorhome and the car, we had a tow car behind us. Uh, between the motorhome and the car, we did 56,000 miles in 16 months. I we love did it, man. nine states, went up to Alaska for the first time. Yeah, we just traveled. So altogether, I took five years off. Five years? Five years. I don't know how you stood to, to live with yourself taking five years. I can't take more than two weeks off and I get freaking nuts, man. I got to go back to work. Yeah, I hear you. And that's ultimately what happened. I decided I wanted to look for a business, but purchasing businesses from mom and pops is difficult because they want to sell you what it's what it will be worth once you put the work into it mm. versus what it's actually worth now. And the analogy that I used with many of them or with several of them was, okay, if I were to try and sell you a car that was dented and had no motor, would you pay the same for it as if it were fit, wasn't dented and had a motor? No. Well, that's what you're asking me to do. Yeah. 
your business is dented and doesn't have a motor where I'm going to bring it and where you have it. I'm not going to pay you for what I'm going to do. Yeah. So my point is I looked for businesses for several years. It didn't work. And finally, I decided that I was going to start my own. And that's how I got into restoration. Okay. I was an economics major. And I understand that there are going to be ebbs and flows in the economy. So after my first business was recession resistant, I wanted my second one to be recession resistant. So I got into restoration work. So, you know, fire, water, vehicle impact. I did that for about 13 years. Wow. And we, at our height, did about 300 jobs a year. Quite a bit. That's, a, that's busy. Oh, it's busy. And, busy. and, and you, must, you must have been nuts, like pulling your hair out and stuff. And it's 24-7, 365. Yeah. And that's why I ultimately sold. It's just a very difficult industry. Uh, and you're price constrained by the estimating program that the insurance companies force you to use. Mm. So the quality of your work is secondary to who's going to follow their guidelines and give them discounts on pricing that was already discounted. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm sorry. So after 13 years, I saw I was going to say, oh, yeah, for that business, we also had we also did full contents uh, processing. So contents in a personal sense are, if you were to take your house, flip it upside down, everything that comes out is contents. Yeah. Everything that doesn't come out is structure. So we used to be able to clean like televisions and we could spray them with water uh, and clean them and they still worked. All right. Trick question. Does water conduct electricity? Yes. It does not. Okay. Explain. It's the iron in the water that conducts the electricity. If there's no uh, iron, hydrogen and oxygen don't conduct electricity. Got it. What we had was a deionization filtering system where we could pull the iron out of the water and we would uh, be able to wet your television, dry it, plug it in, and the TV worked fine. Love it. So, yeah, like I said, we did about 300 of those jobs a year. So yeah. that in 2017 and... After taking the five years off before and thinking things through, I decided to start, uh, I was going to start flipping because I was used to doing 300 houses a year. Yeah. So flipping a house 10 a month is going to be easy for me. Mm -hmm. But I spoke with somebody who has, so I did it, I did handshakes, handshake loans. And then I spoke with somebody who has nine figures of his own capital on the street. Okay. He was nice enough to take my call. He was referred to me by somebody. He was nice enough to take my call. And he explained to me in about 45 minutes the volume of money, the volume of finance and how it really works. And he just ran some quick numbers. And it was funny because he was, I was an economics major, so was he. And he went to Princeton and then the London School of Economics. So he's well above me. But we hit it off. And after about 45 minutes of talking, he said, okay, I got to go. I was planning on a five-minute call. I didn't know you were going to be a fellow economics major. I thought this was going to be quick. I got to go. And I said to him, dude, I got to tell you something. Please take this in a heterosexual way in which it's meant, but I think I love you. And he said, "He said, <laughs> okay, we have a bromance. I don't like the love thing, but I'm okay with the romance. I understand. <laughs> He's so he said, I, I understand you people are a little more fluid today. Yeah. And he and I just started, we had a good, we had a good chuckle about that. That's awesome. And then I was set up to run a flipping operation. I had a partner set up. I was going to do the operations. He was going to do the front end. And after speaking with this guy, I sat there for three minutes, walked out to Lois, my better half of 35 plus years and said, listen, I'm not going to flip houses. I'm just going to lend. And her response was, well, it's about fucking time. I've been telling you that for two years. You have <laughs> to tell you that? Oh, I've my God. You, you should just lend. You've got the capital. You have friends who have capital. Just do it. It's like, okay. I get on the phone with the guy who's going to be my partner. And I said, Josh, I'm out. What do you mean you're out? We set everything up. This is what I'm going to do. Sorry, dude, I'm out. And I gave him everything because I'm operations. I set up all the operations. I gave him everything. I said, I'm out the door. See you oh. later. And he's off doing his thing. And. I'm off lending. I love what Lois said to you. I love <laughs> yeah. that. Because you know what? So I don't, I'm not sure if, is Lois coming with you to Florida? Are we going to see each other? 
Yeah, she's definitely going to be okay. there. All right. My my wife, Alex, is coming as well. And I think the two of them are, are going to have a good time together, too. So <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for them to meet. I'm excited for you to to meet my wife. You guys are have very, very similar uh, personalities and, and humor styles, too. So it's it's going to be cool. But anyway, I love that Lois said that to you. And obviously, like, you know, having having a partner that backs you, that supports you, that that doesn't give you bullshit, you know, that tell, just tells you the way that it is. Like, I think that's extremely important for, for all of us, too. Well, I think people have asked me what it is, why it is that we've been together so long. And I think the thing for me is I knew what I was looking for and I know my personality. I'm a type A from a violent neighborhood. So I know I can't be with a timid individual. So what did I do? I connected with somebody who's from New York. Well, she's not going to take anything from anybody. It's a girl right. who the subway at two o'clock in the morning. She's not, she doesn't <laughs> take crap from anybody. Yeah. So it was just, you know, it, it was a connection and it was yeah. a great connection, but it's a matter of, you know, searching for your person who's like you or it compliments you. And it's not somebody who's, you know, you have this ideal that isn't reality and you've got, and you're trying, you, I guess more importantly, you try and make somebody something that they're not. Yeah. And I never tried that. I just found somebody that would, that could compliment me. And she has no problem telling me where to go. She has her own capital. She doesn't need me. So yeah, it's a matter of finding somebody who, who you connect with and will give you grief and support you. I support what she wants to do. She supports what I want to do. And it's, it works very well. Like I said, it'll be 36 years in June that we've been That's together. Awesome. That's so, awesome. That's great. So with the business, I was going to say, and I kind of went down a, a road there. Okay. So after my first business and taking all that time off, I knew I didn't want to do it because now I'm over 50. I'm doing research on what happens as you get older. And the research shows that if you stay physically and mentally active, the probability of Alzheimer's dementia decreases exponentially. And you just, you live a, a healthier, a healthier, happier life. And I had a physical therapist one time that told me that motion is lotion. Mm. If you sit around, your muscles and your body start to creak. You hear people get up and they crack and they're, ooh, ah. Uh. Yeah. I don't want to be an old man that gets up like that. Screw that. I love that. Motion is lotion. All right. I'm yeah. writing that one down. <laughs> and you have to keep moving. So I wanted to keep moving. And I had to decide because I've been okay since I was 33, what my purpose was. It can't just be more because more doesn't really matter. It gets boring right. after a while. So I thought back to when I used to work with kids and they come across, they, they, they eventually at 18 hit what's called within foster care, black bag day or government care. And black what that bag, means, black bag black, day, black bag day. Got it. And what happens is they turn 18 and the facility that they're in hands them a black trash bag mm -hmm. and they have to put their belongings in the black trash bag and they're out the door. Yeah. Black bag day. Yeah. So some of them have aftercare. Most do not, and they're on their own. They have to find friends or somebody in the family who will help them out. And if they don't have, then usually they're homeless. They're homeless. That's that. Yeah, they're done. The government gets written, stops giving them care at 18, which I understand. So they can get into drugs, uh, robbery, and all these other things. Now, not all of them do that, but it does happen to a fair amount. So what I've decided to do with the capital from my private lending business is I want to get a certain amount and I want to start a program for kids who age out of foster care, uh, black bag day and technical skills are easy to teach. I can teach if I were a plumber, I could teach somebody how to be a plumber. Yeah. If I'm an electrician. I can teach someone how to be an electrician, et cetera. Those are technical skills. The hard part with humans is teaching in what in human service circles is called soft skills. I can't teach you to care. I can't teach you to show up to work on time. I can't teach you to have integrity. Those are, as an employer, nearly impossible to teach somebody. If you don't learn that at home, it's almost impossible for you to learn it. Yeah, yeah, But I, I also, having worked in alcohol and drug treatment services, unless somebody realizes that they need to change, 
they're not going to change because they don't know anything better. Yeah. So I want to start a program where we work on the soft skills and I want to do it from a science-based perspective. So I want to have psychologists and psychiatrists on staff that explain to, the, to our uh, clients how the brain works and how the mind works from a chemical perspective and how mindset works and how the thought process can, can affect you physically. You may not be aware of this, but back pain not caused by a physical injury only exists in developed countries. Wow. And the reason for that is when people get tense, they tense up their muscles and it causes back pain and neck hmm. pain. So I want so to a, have so that there's a direct So there's a direct correlation between back pain in developed countries versus back pain in non-developed countries. Non-developed countries, back pain that is not from a physical injury. Obviously, if you fall, well, that's yeah. a physical injury. I'm talking about these people that have back pain and they don't know why. And it's wow. in their shoulders and their lower back. And it's from tensing up all the time because they're under constant stress. Wow. So I want to teach them, again, how the brain and the mind works. I want to have uh, experts in exercise on staff to explain to them how the body works, nutritionists on staff to explain how that works. I want to have business owners come in and explain how business works. I want finance experts to come in and explain to them how banking really works. None of this garbage that's not taught in school mm -hmm. so that they don't know how to do a checking account. Yep. You think your buddy that you have a bromance with, he would come in and speak? If he's still around, absolutely. This is a well-known guy in the real estate industry. If I said him, many people know who, would know who he is. Mm. But I want to keep it confidential because he hasn't given me a right to, to use his yeah. name in a situation like this. Yeah, of course. And one of the things that we talked about the neck pain is I also want to have a, somebody on staff who practices and teaches meditation. I've been meditating since 1996. And I do it from a scientific perspective where I'm focusing on silent meditation. I've done single day, three day and five day silent meditation retreats. Wow. Next year, I would like to do a 10 day silent meditation retreat. And you start, depending on where you go, you generally start at about six or seven in the morning and you end around 10 o'clock at night and there's no eye contact. You're, you don't have your phone. There's no television. You can't bring books. And, and what that does is, and people are always freaked out by this who haven't practiced it, it's kind of like a workout for the mind. It's actually a workout for the mind. And what you're doing is you're recognizing thoughts that are coming up. And I don't want to do, be, go too deep into this, but your thoughts just come up and your thoughts are not you. They're based on previous experience and your education and so on and so forth. So they come up, but you don't have to respond to all of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that is important for the kids to learn because they're going to have many thoughts that are not appropriate thoughts or are not accurate. And they have to learn to be able to recognize them and analyze them as opposed to just acting on them instantaneously. Yeah, deflecting the intrusive thoughts rather than accepting them. No, no, a little deeper than that, actually reflecting on them and mm. saying, okay, that's a thought. Where is that coming from? What's causing it? And kind of going down that path, you actually lean right into it. And I used to have neck pain. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the things I did was I went to my doctor and this is when Prozac was the, was the vitamin of choice. And I was having stress. And he said to me, you can, I'm not giving you Prozac because I know you don't like medication. And I won't give that out because I don't think you need it. He said, you can go to yoga, which is something that I, pra I started to practice when I was getting divorced. You can smoke pot. I have a dealer I can recommend for you. Or there is a training that's going on. This guy's starting to get some press around it at the Center for Mindfulness at UMass Medical Center in Worcester, Mass, which is about an hour and a half from where I live. Mm -hmm. He said he's getting some very interesting results. Hmm. I can, your health plan will pay you for it. Give them a call and I'll sign for it. And I went and that's how I started meditation. I learned from John Kabat-Zinn, who if you're not into meditation, you won't know. 
But if you are, he's the guy who brought meditation to the Western world, in my opinion. Wow. He was a, he is a PhD in microbiology from MIT. Hmm. So this is a bright guy. Yeah. And the way it started was he was in a class and they had some Buddhist monks come and talk about meditation. He thought it was fascinating and he dedicated his whole career to it for 40 years. He's wow. written multiple books. And from his initial studies, there have been over 4,000, or from his findings, there have been over 4,000 studies that wow. have enforced and proven the benefits of meditation and what it does for the human body and for the mind. Yeah. So from those studies, that's how I know that back pain in non-developed countries doesn't exist because they're not under the stress that we're under. Yeah, I'm a big believer in meditation, but I've never done it to the lengths that you have. I mean, a 10-day silent retreat basically is what you're talking about doing. But it's not just silent. It's also no outside stimulus. It's no phones, no TVs, no books, magazines, anything else. Nothing. What about other people? Oh, yeah. You'll be, it's, uh, meditation actually is done best when there are other people. Believe it or not, you can get a deeper state. I think it's the connection that people make without going too deep. So what you do is you'll generally go into a hall and it'll be depending on how many people they let in and you'll generally sit 10 or 15 feet away from each other and that's it. And you, oh, and you will have a facilitator who will okay. talk because mm -hmm. you'll sit most places you'll sit for the first, you know, 45 minutes and then you'll stand uh, and you'll walk and they have, they'll generally rotate those three things. And they'll also intersperse yoga with it as well. Wow. So wow. yeah, I've done the five day. That was a challenge. Uh, I'm sure it was. So, you know, with the nonprofit, you're going to layer that in, right? And are you going to have like a physical location where all these people are going to come into or did I miss that part? Yeah, I didn't go over that. Good question. Yeah. We're going to have a location where people are going to come. Uh, both the instructors as well as the clients. And what it's going to be is the majority of it, in my humble opinion, or what I see coming up is, or how I'm, sorry, how I'm setting it up, is that we will have maybe 10 or 15% of sit on your butt and learn stuff. Mm -hmm. The other 90, 85 to 90% is going to be actually, actually doing what it is that they're, they're learning. So if they're going to learn finance, I want them to go to a bank and have the bank explain finance to them, have them work through the process of how money uh, compounds and actually have them see how it all works within the bank. Um, okay. well, for business owners, I want them to go to a business and speak with the HR people so that they understand and go through a, a mock interview so they understand what it means to go through an interview. It's, I want, again, 85 to 90% is going to be actual experience and not just sitting in a classroom because sitting in a classroom doesn't do anything. Hence the reason people get degrees and they come out and they don't know what the heck they're doing. Yeah. So it's funny. I was, it's funny you mentioned that we, uh, I was talking to a lady yesterday. She got her MBA from a very highly regarded school here in California. I said, well, what are you doing with your MBA? And she said, oh, I'm a uh, electrical project manager at Southern California Edison. I was like, oh, but how do you use your MBA for that? She said, I don't. <laughs> I said, well, why did you go to school for that? Well, I wanted to be in statistics and this and that and the other. And, you know, I, want, I, I needed to get my MBA for that. But then I got out of school and realized it's not what I wanted to do. And then here's another case where you're just burdened with a bunch of debt. And yeah. for, for absolutely no, no reason, if you will, that is not applicable to their, to their future life. So I really like what you're doing. I really, really do. I think yeah, it's going to be huge. Yeah. It's just to go back to my first business. When we started that, I was working in the psych hospital. I worked the third shift and my former business partner was working at a different psych hospital in Massachusetts. I happened to be in Rhode Island at Butler hospital. He was at McLean hospital in Massachusetts. And that we had in savings, we had about $5,000 between us. And that was it. Hence the reason we didn't buy a phone at first. And we used our mother's phones mm -hmm. because we had to bootstrap everything. Yeah. So my point is for what ultimately became about $5,000, we turned it into a multi-million dollar exit. 
Yeah. And it's from getting in there and actually doing the work. Yeah. This stuff where you learn to be an accountant. You know, I took some accounting courses. I learned more from running three businesses than I ever learned in school. Yeah. So yeah. it's the hands-on stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to to that the gentleman who gave you a bunch of advice. And he talked about like the flow of money and how, you know, the whole monetary system kind of works. What did he teach you that's not taught in schools? Hmm. Well, that's a lot. I know um, it's a lot, but just give, give us a couple little snippets. Well, what he, well, the first thing he started with was talking about you want to go where the money is and who always has the biggest, nicest buildings insurance companies and banks, and they're there no matter what the economy is. So that was the basic foundation of where he started. And then he went over explaining how compounding works and how using other people's money as part of what it is that you're doing and the quick math on how that works and how if you don't actually run the numbers through, through like years at a time, and see how it's actually growing, you don't get it. You actually have to run some numbers. So he ran some formulas with me and some math so I could get to the numbers quicker. And he said, see, you're telling me that you can do this on day one. This is what it's going to be worth in 10 years. But look what it's going to be worth in 20 years. Wow. So I understand people understand, comp or I know that people understand compounding. But when you actually sit down and see what you can do with those numbers and how you can Put it on steroids by using investor money as well it just will blow your mind and even it's some very deep formulas i've got them written down and i use them on occasion but he went down into the nitty-gritty of how it works wow yeah that's, all, that's awesome and he explained the legal side and things i needed to look for and you know he gave me some general understanding of underwriting um and then I just jumped into it. I did some handshake loans and then started papering stuff up in uh, 2019. Okay. And have been very serious for the last, uh, go God, going on five years now. Wow. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. and, and so everything that he kind of told you, right? It made you obviously, like you said, it, it made you decide to to just not do any of the flipping of houses or anything like that because- that's what just too labor intensive and there's there's not a, as much money in it or what made you decide to just go strictly into private lending there isn't nearly as much money in it and it also requires you to have a specific location mm -hmm. so as a lender for example i like to travel i've been to all 50 states which is what i did in the motorhome i did 39 states in the motorhome but altogether i've been to all 50 states i've been to 32 countries and four continents my goal is to go to all seven countries, I'm sorry, all seven continents and a hundred countries. So I've got yeah. 68 left to go. Yeah. When I'm lending, everything is done electronically. Mm -hmm. I've never been, I've never seen, actually, that's until I saw one house that I've lent at and I happen to be living in Phoenix at the time. Okay. I keep out anywhere from 40 to 60 loans. And other than that one house, I have never seen physically any house that I've lent on. Wow. Everything is done through videos, inspections, uh, photos and so on and so forth. So because everything can be done electric, elect, I'm sorry, electronically, as long as I have a computer and I have Wi-Fi, I can do loans from anywhere in the world. Last September for Lois's birthday, we were in, we were in uh, Africa. We went to Kenya and Tanzania. We were on a three week safari. And what happens when you go on safari is you go out in the morning the afternoon, the heat of the day, you, you come back to the lodge and then you'll go on a late afternoon, early evening uh, safari uh, track, uh, to, sorry, uh, drive. And okay. you see, you look for the animals. OK, so during the day, you're hanging out at the lodge and we had some really nice lodges. But what I would do is if my assistant sent me something that uh, we, I had something I had to look at, I would take a look at it and I sent out two loans from Africa. I had my assist. I have an assistant who's very good. She set okay. stuff up for me, and I have a fractional bookkeeper. And I'm training another person right now, and because of the volume that I have, and it allows me to go anywhere I want in the world. Amazing. I'm still too hands-on now. I haven't totally been able to institute, you know, 
being a magician versus a mule, to use our friend Mark's uh, Mark's yeah. book name uh, title. But I need to get more and more away from that. You know, more and more and more away from the hands on and more just managing. But to answer, I know that was kind of a long answer. No, it's not. I, I love these rants because we we unpack so much and we get to learn as we talk. Yeah, but I don't want to bore the crap out of your audience. Sometimes I think I'm boring people. I mean, if um, they made it, if they made it this long in the interview, they're committed. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> so yeah, what was I going to say? So I forgot where I was going with that. I lost. Well, let me let me trigger your memory. Okay. So one thing that you know you I can travel. That's why I want the business in a backpack. I can go anywhere I want. That's exactly I'm what I was just going to say. Was business in a backpack? You. You were the inspiration for me a long time ago when we spoke about having to do that, right? I want to have my business in a backpack. And you know my background, blue collar, having to be on site, very physical, demanding stuff. Yep. Business in a backpack is the way to go. I'm telling you, man, it's so freeing. Um, as long as you have the people in place that can run stuff and you can manage them, that's what I want. Yeah. You know, I'm also... One of the reasons I moved to where I am now is I'm an avid whitewater kayaker. Mm -hmm. So I can go, I'm 45, from 45 minutes from me, I can be on a class four river. I could be on a class five river as well. I only go as high as class four. Um, so I want to be able to kayak in the summer seven days a week if I want to. Now, yeah. we recently moved back here after being away for a while. And I went out 20 times this year. Well, now I've worked up, I was away from here for seven years. I've now worked up my my group of kayakers. My goal is to go 60 times next summer. Wow. So because I've set up my business the way that it is, I can work several hours a day, go off and play, and then come back to the house, go to bed, and start the next day. Yeah. My goal is to work Monday through Thursday because I want the mental stimulation. Mm -hmm. And then take Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. That's the agreement that I have with Lois starting this summer. Okay. The thing is, as people get older, as I said, I think earlier, I'm, I'm interested in uh, uh, people who are over 50. And I told mm -hmm. you I was going to start a community around that. Yeah. I don't want to be the guy who sits and watches Netflix and has a stroke watching television. Yeah. I'd rather drown kayak. <laughs> Um, I've got a buddy of mine who I'm taught, well, I would, um, you know, you, you fall and you hit your head in the living room because you're fat or you're drunk or whatever the case may be, or yeah, yeah. you die, you know, kayaking or, or your, uh, zip line lets go or something like that. That's where I want to go. Yeah. Um, and you know, as far as the travel and stuff, I've got a buddy of mine and we're talking about going to Nepal next year. And we want to uh, trek to Everest Base Camp. It takes two weeks. He happens to be a lender as well. He's half my age, uh, uh, almost half my age. And um, we're talking about doing that for a couple of weeks. So my point is, as you get older, you have to have mental stimulation. And when I took the time off from my first business, I'm telling you my brain went to mush. It took me about a year to get my brain back. Wow. So I want to keep working and I want to keep having purpose and focus. And by working the 20 hours a week and having the foundation as my ultimate purpose and my goal, it keeps me focused and motivated every day because, and I'm not flexing, we're having a conversation. I've been fine financially since I was 33. Mm -hmm. And there are days where I'm up here working and I say, what the fuck am I doing this for? I don't have to do this. Yeah. Lois, let's, Let's sell our shit and go to fucking Europe and backpack. Yeah. You know, let's go to China. Let's do something. And those thoughts have crossed my mind. But I also have the inner uh, struggle where I want to help these kids and I want to leave a legacy behind. Yeah. And my goal is to get enough money so that I can leave a legacy behind. We're actually naming the foundation. It'll be Lois's initials. It's the LDB Foundation is what's going to what it's going to be. So I want to leave a legacy. Uh, and I need the mental stimulation. So work yeah. 20 hours a week, take weekends off and do trips and, you know, travel. And I think that that's a huge lesson for, for a lot of people out there, you know, in the world that are, that are slaving away at a W2 job, 40 to 60 hours a week. And they, they want to, to live a different life. And I think that a lot of people can't see how, right. They can't see the path to doing so. 
But, you know, if we tie it all back to what you want to do with your foundation, I believe it comes from education as well. They don't know how because they were never shown how. Right. For people like that, what I can tell you is I was never shown how. But let me give, hopefully this will inspire at least one person. And, to, and I'll kind of circle back to what I said before. I grew up in a violent area. There was a kid who grew up in our area, Chris Heron, and it's public knowledge. He's written a book, so I'm not letting anything out uh, that's private. And he made it to the Celtics. Well, where I'm from, if you make it to the Celtics, you're like a god. You walk yeah. into the room and it lights up and you go, oh, and he made it. Well, what he would do is he would go, I'm um, oh, sorry, if he had a game at night, he would drive from Boston down to Fall River, shoot up some heroin and go play in the NBA. Holy shit. And there is a, there was a, there's an ESPN special about him. And one of the guys, Bill Reynolds, who used to write for the Boston Herald said, you can leave Fall River, but you can't take Fall River out of the person. Wow. And that's what, and this kid was a son of a lawyer. And it just happened to be where we grew up. I was a C student in school. I was told by my uh, sophomore year biology teacher that I was retarded. He said that in front of the class. And when I started my first business, I knew I wanted to get into business. I knew I didn't have the people skills to work for somebody else because I had tried it mm -hmm. and didn't have a tremendous amount of luck at it. And I just started. So we went, we got the postcard. We went and got 16 hours of training and just knocked on doors. And yeah. the first medical alert system we installed, now understand they're modular, the, you know, pre-dinosaur days, you have to plug, plug them in. Well, there were people that had hardwired phones. I had no idea what wires I was supposed to use. So it took us like three hours. Understand, you have four, plug, four wires on a hardwired yeah. phone. Before okay. we figured out, it was the red and green. And this being uh, uh, Christmas season, that's what we taught people. The Christmas colors will make it work. And that's actually how we taught our technicians. I love it. <laughs> we were there for four hours, and we told the guy that there was a problem with his He was an older guy. He actually fell asleep at one point because a lot of elderly <laughs> people get these. And we're trying to figure this out. We're like, God damn, this thing's going to work. It won't work. It won't work because it worked in the office when we could plug it in and blah, blah, blah. And we figured it out. So the thing is, you've got, just got to figure it out. When I, and people are going to laugh and go ahead. I get laughed at all the time for this. My dad left when I was five. I have no construction knowledge. I have no ability to fix my car. If it doesn't take gas and put in the window washer fluid, I'm out. Anything beyond that is beyond my skill set. I know that to change oil, there's a nut underneath. I have no idea where it is. I've never been under vehicle and looked for it. When I started my construction company, I was an economics major. I did not know that a flathead screwdriver was called a flathead screwdriver and a Phillips head screwdriver was called a Phillips head screwdriver. I had wow. absolutely no idea. That was a learning experience for me. What I was strong at was I went to the top three schools in the country on structural drying. That was the science. I sat mm -hmm. back and I thought about this. This is recession resistant because if somebody has a flood or fire in the house, they're getting it fixed. Yep. So it checks that off. I can hire people who are superintendents and project managers to put houses back together. Because they're every, these people are everywhere. And construct, uh, home construction is evolutionary. It's not revolutionary. Houses aren't built much different than they were 200 years ago on their, you know, from the basic level. There are some changes, but it's pretty similar. Mm -hmm. So the changes, again, are evolutionary. So I thought, okay, those things are taken care of. Where's the difficult skill set? Hmm. I need to learn how to structurally dry things because we actually got to the point where we could dry a wood floor in place that had been flooded and you didn't have to refinish it and it sat down flat. Wow. So that's where the science was. And then there's the science in cleaning contents, as I explained earlier, to know that if you take the iron out of the water, you can wet anything, any yeah. piece of electronic. It doesn't matter as long as you dry it first. So that was the stuff that I focused on, and I hired project managers for, the, for putting houses back together, the construction side. And what I would do is, 
when I started the business, I had to write the estimates. Well, I had a guy that I found in Washington State who had 40 years of experience in construction. Wow. And I said, listen, dude, I just started this company and I don't know shit about construction. And, and I he, said, and he joined you. <laughs> no, what happened was I would call him on Fridays and I would have Fridays with William. Okay. And I would sit with him for one to three hours, depending on how long we decided we were going to talk that day and how much energy. And he would explain how a house was put together from the dirt work all the way up to the roof and everything that goes on. Oh and God. if I got onto a job site and I was estimating something, I would look at it, didn't know what it was called. I didn't know baseboard was called baseboard. I had no freaking idea. So I would I say, you know, that stuff at the bottom of the wall. OK, that's called baseboard. Well, this one isn't flat. The other one was flat. OK, this one has a profile. And he said, send me a picture. OK, well, this is the type of baseboard that it is. And that's not wood. That's MDF. There's a difference. Really? What's that? Oh, micro micro dense fiberboard. That is just paper that's put together. If that gets wet, just pull it off. You're not going to dry it. It's going to bubble. But you can dry wood. And he explained the whole construction process. And he did this for months. And when we were done, actually, I would start, I read my project manager's estimates. They thought I was reading their project manager, es their estimates to approve them. No, I was learning, reading them so I could understand construction. <laughs> so your people who are afraid to get started. I've started two multi-million dollar businesses and I didn't know shit from shit. Hey everybody, really quick, I just wanted to let you know that we do this for free. We do this out of the goodness of our heart. And all that we ask of you is just to quickly leave a review if you wouldn't mind. It really helps the algorithm and it helps push this out to a lot more people every time you do that. And if you've already subscribed, that's awesome. Thank you so much. But definitely leave a review. It really, really helps us out. And I know for you guys, it only takes like less than 30 seconds. Okay, back to the show. So your people who are afraid to get started. I've started two multi-million dollar businesses and I didn't know shit from shit in either business. That's, 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 a, quote, quote that's a quote right there, Mike. You, you got to write that one down for yourself. I've started two multi-million dollar businesses and I didn't know shit from shit. <laughs> I'm telling you. Now, the second one was easier because I understood legal and accounting. So it was easier from that perspective. But the first time, I had no freaking idea. We actually sent a postcard. We were calling people, but though, then we thought, Mark's one to many, how do we get a hold of these people? Well, we started a business from a postcard. Let's do some direct mail. So we sent out a postcard that said, medical alert system, if you have a medical condition, uh, uh, sorry, this is where we got bagged, public service announcement. If you have qualifying medical conditions, Medicaid in the state of Massachusetts will pay for your medical alert system. Call us now. Well, as I learned in my $40,000 fine later, Ouch. in the state of Massachusetts, now this is 40000 back in 1988. Yeah. <laughs> we found out that you cannot, a for-profit for business cannot send out a postcard that says public service announcement because oh. it's not. It's an advertisement. Yeah. Well, the attorney general of Massachusetts was nice enough to bring that to our attention. <laughs> well, isn't that nice of them? <laughs> yes. And after some negotiation and a $40,000 fine, we had to sign a, a consent decree not to do that again. And they made us jump through some other hoops. And my point is that I learned legal as well. Yeah. Now, ultimately, the $40,000 was minimal compared to what we were making. Yeah. And I think you and I talked about this once before. When it comes to alarm companies, and I don't know what they sell for now. It's been too many years. We sold that company for 17 times our MRR. That's wild. It's medical alert systems. It, the people tie into agreements, and you've got them for a year or two. And it is just, we paid $3.50 a month for monitoring, and we rented them for $30 a month as high as 39 depending on what bells and whistles they have with it well wow. i'm paying 350 a month yeah that's it when you buy the equipment we negotiated with the manufacturer we were paying 110 dollars for our most expensive equipment mm -hmm. well you charge first last and an installation fee on day one i was making money 
Yeah. Actually, the second month, if it was $30 a month, the second month I was making money and I paid $3.50 a month for monitoring. And the yeah. sweet thing is we didn't sell the equipment. We rented it. So somebody dies or pass, dies or goes into a nursing home. We go take the equipment back. We recondition it, which yeah. means we cleaned it and put a new sticker on it and put it in somebody else's house. We had equipment that we had used eight or nine times wow. in different people's houses over the 10 years. And it just, it's, it's a, you just keep compounding on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, you know you're going to lose a certain number of customers every month because they die or go into nursing homes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So if you were to, let's say hypothetically, if you were to restart that same model of business in current day and age with current technology, what would that business look like? What, I mean, would you do alarm monitoring again like that? Or I mean, oh, fuck yeah. Every fucking day of the week. This is what you do. I spoke with somebody when we were living in Phoenix and we were, he was talking about the industry and how it had changed. Now, we were medical alert systems, but the monitoring station is the same. It's very similar in what it is that you do. The equipment is cheap as hell. These guys don't give a damn about the equipment. They want MRR, monthly mm -hmm. recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. They want you to tie into a five-year agreement. So... I would find the equipment, which you can buy in China. It doesn't matter. You buy the equipment, you white label it, you put it up, and you get as many fucking customers as you can. And then once you have a certain amount, you find a monitoring station that's willing to buy those customers from you. And then you get that big chunk of money, and I'd go right back into getting more company, uh, more uh, customers okay. and, or subscribers, as they're called, and that's what we call them. Because ultimately, it is a volume game, but you are making so much money every time you sell these guys. And monitoring stations buy these monitoring accounts all the time. Hmm. The guy that we got our alarm system, our alarm system in Phoenix from explained that's exactly what he was doing. He and I just had a bullshit conversation. He was the owner. We started talking. I had medical alert systems. And I started, he started explaining how it works. I said, shit, that's what we did. He said, yeah, man, you just buy the cheapest fucking equipment. You go and you stall it for a buck 99. I don't give a shit about the equipment. I want those five-year contracts. That's what I want. Wow. Now, nowadays, I mean, shit, I got a Simply Safe system where I live now. You take the damn, that's why Simply Safe is able to exist. You simply take it, you plug it in, you, you stick it to the wall, and that's it. Yeah. And you have a base station, it is such an easy business model. And there's so much money in it, especially with crime. You just scare the shit out of people with crime. You just need to show them what's yeah. going on in their neighborhood. They have these apps now that you can see the criminals in the neighborhood. Send that to somebody. Let me show you what's happened in your neighborhood. I can protect you. You need Mike's alarm. Yeah. And we have a UL approved underwriters laboratory approved central monitoring station. And if that one goes down, we have a backup station. And that's what we did with the medical alert systems. The central station was in New Jersey, and the backup station was in Euclid, Ohio. Wow. And that's it. Oh, alarm systems every fucking day of the week. So is there, like, I mean, there's obviously some massive players in the space, but if somebody wanted to start one of these right now, would they be worried about big competition or no? They just go out and get their local market and then... Who gets there first? People don't care. Alarm systems are a, are, a, are a commodity. That's it. So you get somebody who's good at sales, they'll kick ass every day of the week because what they can do is they can play. People, because of what happened, and it's actually even better now, because of what happened during COVID where mom and pops got put out of business, I, mm -hmm. for one, do everything I can not to buy from nationals. Mm -hmm. I do, but I make it a conscious choice to say, if I can buy local, or from a mom and pop, even if they're on the other side of the country, that's what I'm going to do. Same and right. I think a lot of people do that now. Yeah. So all you say is, Brinks is a bad company. They're, they're a big company. They don't care about you. I'm Mike. I live down the street. I live in town. So let's to play basketball together. And you're the local guy that yeah. can help them. People will take that every day of the week. And, that's, and Brinks and ADT, invariably, if you look online, have somebody who didn't get service when they needed it. An ambulance didn't show up. The police didn't show up. It could have been the cop's fault or the ambulance driver, but that's not who people see. You can take those offline and say, this has never happened to us. We'll be there for you. We're local. 
Yeah. Wow. Oh, I wouldn't give a damn about national competition. That wouldn't bother me at all. And so what you're saying is these days it's easier than ever because you have all these wireless devices now. You don't even need to plug them together. Yeah. You know, everything's wireless and you don't have to worry about the low voltage. You have to be licensed to do low voltage in some areas, I believe. You can just do it. It's very simple. You just plug, you take the thing and stick it to the wall and you're done. You can yeah. install a whole system in 30 minutes. You're going to be charging them for it. So take longer than 30 minutes, but that's how it's a simple thing. I set up my whole Simply Safe system and I'd never done it before in about 45 minutes. Wow. Can you, you imagine? Installed it, you installed it yourself? Yeah, you just plug it in. You take so you, it, you put it yeah. up on the wall where you want it. And the base station recognizes it, oh, every day of the week. Interesting. Now, what about liability? The liability is with the central station. Okay. The central station doesn't respond. So I would get an indemnification uh, agreement with the central station. And I would also have, huh, I would set up a my corporation and then, now I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving legal advice. Oh, no so legal look, advice here. No legal advice at all. Does no Mike even advice. look like a lawyer to you? If you confuse Mike with a lawyer, you got bigger problems. <laughs> I'm just giving you my opinion of what I would do, and I would check everything with a lawyer. You set up a corporation, and then you set up a limited liability company, which is passed through for tax purposes, but for legal purposes, it's its own entity. You sell 200 alarms through that entity. And then you sell another 200 through another entity and another 200 through another entity. You have insurance on each one, or if you can get a blanket policy, then when you're su- if you're sued, they only go after the, the assets of that one entity, and you've got five or six doing the same damn thing. Hmm. Not oh, legal advice. Six. What's that? Not, not legal advice. Not legal advice. Go talk to an attorney. Yeah, no, that's smart though, Mike, you know, and and every time you and I get together, we have, you know, one conversation that usually ends up like this, where we're like, this is how I would do it. This is how we would, you know, grow this thing. And then going back to business in a backpack, this whole thing is business in a backpack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you could set it up nationwide, just like Simply Safe did. All you need is a warehouse and UPS does it now. You need a logistics company that will store your shit. Mm hmm. They take it, they put it in a box, and send out what it is that you purchased. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, you can just hire a 3PL, right? Third-party logistics warehouse, yep. and they do all of your fulfillment for you. They do your inventory, your order tracking, everything. Yep. And then you find a company that will do your monitoring for you. Mm-hmm. And to make the customers feel good, you find a central station that's a backup station just in case. Mm-hmm. Because people always ask, well, what happens if something happens to the central station? Oh, well, we have a backup one in another part of the country. Wow, you guys have thought everything through. No, I didn't think through anything. I saw Mike on a podcast, and that's right. (laughs) (laughs) You just learn from the people. Now, I didn't come up with that idea. I had an alarm system at my home in Massachusetts. The guy who installed the alarm explained that he had two central stations. Ding, we need a backup central station. Mm -hmm. So he went out and found a backup central station. Yeah, we actually went. It's funny. You talk about having to know uh, people stop because they don't say they don't know how we trademarked our name. We were going to hire an attorney. They wanted like 10 grand. Well, my partner get on the phone, made a bunch of calls and he spoke with the U.S. trademark office and they said, you can absolutely do it through an attorney or you can fill out the forms that they fill out and send it to us. And if there's a problem, we'll send it back because we're the government. We like to look for mistakes and create more paperwork. <laughs> no, that's exactly what the guy said. He said, you're not going to believe what the guy just told me. So we sent the forms in. It probably took two or three times. And then we, and we, we sent them to him because we had had the, he had had the conversation with him. And we got the name trademarked. That's it. And it's funny because the name was Access 911. And... Porsche, because it has to go out for whatever the review period is or whatever they call it, Porsche objected to it because Why? they object to everything that says 911 in it. Oh, right. 911. Yeah. 911. So <laughs> they sent us a letter, a cease and desist, unless we wanted to sign a concurrent use agreement. So then we had an attorney give them a call and say, what's up? 
And the guy said, listen, we ultimately don't give a shit because we know it has nothing to do with cars and the automotive industry. You're welcome to use it. I'm going to send you a one page agreement that we send out to everybody who registers with 911. This is part of my job at Porsche as their inside counsel is we look for 911 in anything. Wow. And we object to everybody who uses 911 unless they sign a concurrent use agreement that they will only use it for this purpose. And my attorney said, yeah, send it to me. He sent it. He said, guys, sign the damn thing. Yeah. And we were, we were young. We wanted to negotiate everything. He said, don't fucking negotiate anything. Sign the fucking thing. I can't believe it's going to be this easy. Just sign it and send it back. <laughs> okay. We signed it, sent it back, and we we're able to use Access 911 nationally. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, so, we had customers in like uh, we had customers in 15 states. We had several thousand customers. Wow. Access so if, if you had what what about a medical device or a medical uh, alert company these days? Is that saturated and taken over by a few big players or would you do that locally as well? I haven't I haven't followed the industry. What I can tell you is that I would go for our alarm systems just simply because there are more rooftops. What I mean by that is, and there's more time with our people, they generally need it from four, 14 to 16 months and they passed away or going into a nursing home. Well, now we have to replace them. We okay. would lose a hundred or so customers a month to wow. death in a nursing home. So we had to replace them just to break, to be even every month Got it. in order to grow. You'll notice that Brinks and ADT, which are the big players in the market, they try you into a five-year agreement. Because that has value to it. Yeah. You want the long-term agreement. So if it were me, I'm not so sure I would go for the niche. I might just go for alarms. And just advertise the fuck out of it on, you know, social media. You can find, you know, people. It depends on how you want to do it. You can scrape public records, find out whose house got broken into, and suddenly you send them a postcard and say, we do alarm systems. Mm -hmm. We notice you got broken into. We're so sorry. We'll give you a 50% discount on the install. Just sign a five-year monitoring agreement. Woohoo! That's yeah. what I want. I want the monitoring. I don't give a <laughs> shit about the equipment. It's the monitoring. Yeah. Well, especially That's... if you're selling it 17 times monthly. Oh, dude, I'm telling you. That's wild. We, I mean, those, we... those are like tech. That's like tech startup exit multiples, you know, 17, 20 times earnings. Yeah. They're not now even earnings. Think... No, no, no. I mean, revenue. Oh, yeah. It was gross revenue. Yeah. Now, understand. We were in the right place at the right time as well. I'm not going to discount that at all mm -hmm. because we had somebody who was in a had raised money on the public markets and was in a, a buying phase and they contacted us. Well, that's going to happen. Alarm companies are going to want to buy people. Just stay in touch, get up to X number, sell them, and then start getting more people. If that's what you want to do, or you can just keep growing by having more and more people on your system. I like the exit multiple. And a lot of insurance. What's I like that? the exit. I like the exit multiple and the pop at the end. Oh, I, I did too. Yeah, I'd rather that than the, the day to day operations of you know running that business and, I mean, generating that that kind of cash every month is great, but having that exit pop and then not have to do it anymore and make yeah. your choice. That's I think that that's where the real value is. It was for me. If you can find somebody to run it for you then that's an ideal situation as well. To me, they offered us that much money at 33, and my partner was three years younger than me. Wow. So he's 30 years old. He started it at 20. They offer you multiple millions of dollars. You're like, yeah, fuck this. We're out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Because it sets you up for what am I going to do next? I, it's basically like you just started your whole life at that point. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Amazing stuff. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I love it, Mike. Well, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Can you share with everybody where they can find out more about you and your lending business? Sure. I can give you the email address. I'm old school and don't have a website. Okay. And the reason for that is I only lend to very qualified people who are generally referred by somebody else or has been on a podcast that I've spoken on because I don't want to deal with the masses of asses. I want to do with qualified, good people. It's all about the relationships. So my email address is mike at cedaroakrei.com. Cool. And we'll That's put it in the show notes too. And you're on all the socials, right? Mike Seidel. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I think I'm on Instagram. Okay. 
No, understand, it's a weird business. I yeah. Because I have as much money as I do out there with myself and my investors, people contact me all the time. I don't need to advertise. It, it just is. I have what everybody wants. <laughs> I'm going to use a very inappropriate analogy. Feel free to edit this out. Okay? If you got to preface it. <laughs> Feel free. I'm the 18-year-old hot chick that all the other guys want to get with. I got what everybody wants. I've got money. And I don't mean to be arrogant, but that's the reality of the situation. So I don't advertise. I don't need to. And if I find good people I can work with, I'm all over it. I've closed loans. My, my biggest loan that I closed quickly, quickly was $2 million in six hours. I had a three-year relationship with the guy. I had an understanding of him personally and professionally. He got to a close and uh, day before a close, $4 million on his multifamily raise evaporated. Um, somebody had committed it. They didn't have a close go on, so they didn't have the money they thought they were going to have. So he dialed for dollars that night, was able to raise $2 million, called me at 7 o'clock in the morning. It was actually 7.05 because I had never gotten a call like that. He sent me a text. He said, dude, I need your help. He's never texted. He's a friend. He's never texted me. I'm like, shit. And I happened to be in Maryland at a private lender get together. And I called him right away. I said, what's the matter? And he said, somebody screwed me. This is what happened. I need anything you can give me. I need to raise $2 million by 5 o'clock. And I said, interestingly enough, I just had some loans pay off. I have $2 million. I believe I have $2 million. I know I have $2 million available. Got to speak with the investor because it's not all my capital. Some of it is his. So he said, so I said, give me a few minutes. Well, my, my invest, I was on East Coast. My investor is in mountain time, so he's two hours behind. So at 7.20 in the morning East Coast was 5.20 in the morning my investor time. Wow. So I call him. He doesn't answer. About 30 minutes later, he calls me back and says, actually, I texted him, then called him. Calls me about 30 minutes later and says, you're calling me at 5.30, whatever, 5.20, 5.30 in the morning? <laughs> You better be fucking dead if you're calling me at this time. <laughs> and I told him what was going on. He said it took five minutes because he and I have done a number of loans together. It took five minutes to explain what was going on. He said, I'm in. I'll give you what you need. But you're not getting the money until after 10 o'clock mountain time because now I got to sleep. You woke me up and my <laughs> assistant will get in until nine and I'll call her when I get up. Now leave me alone. And he hung up on me. <laughs> So I can do loans quickly with people I have a relationship with. Yeah. Well, and that's it. There's a huge component too, right? Relationship is the key. It's it everything. Relationship capital. I yeah. know a smart guy who gave me that term. Yep. Me too. Relationship capital is key. It's everything. Yeah. I did a loan for a guy. Now I don't do this with investor money. I only do it with my own money. When one of these comes in, I was in New York city on vacation uh, we were going, if you don't know the city, we're going from Greenwich Village down to Little Italy, about a 30-minute walk. Uh, late lunch, early dinner, about 4 o'clock, I get a call. Somebody that I know said, hey, listen, I just found out from title that 130 grand did didn't show up. Hmm. And if I don't have it in there by 4.30, the seller won't give me an extension, and I'm going to lose about 100 grand that I think I'm going to make on this rehab. Wow. Can you help me out? Wow. He said, give me a rundown. No, I had done a number of loans with him. He was very conservative with his uh, after repair value or ARV. So I listened to what he had to say. I said, yeah, I can get it for you. And I'm literally walking in New York City on my phone, wiring this guy 130 grand. And we did the paperwork a week later when I got back from vacation. Wow. But that's all relationships. This that's guy is an eight-figure guy himself. Uh, high high seven-figure, low eight-figure guy. So he was going to pay me back. Yeah. And he's well known in the industry of real estate. So he would pay me back just to pre preserve his uh, reputation. Of course. He's kind of an asshole. If he didn't pay me back, I'd go to one of his events with a bullhorn and say, that fucker didn't pay me back. And I have all the, I have all the proof. <laughs> so he'd pay me back. Yeah. So he'd pay you back. Right. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's like trust but verify, but it's basically like, don't screw me over. Otherwise, I'm going to screw you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Relationships. You know? There we go. So take it from Mike. Don't screw other people over. Yeah. Because they'll get a bullhorn and they'll follow you around. Too. <laughs> yeah. 
And on, on that note, Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. We really appreciate it. It's been a blast. And I know that a ton of people are going to get some huge value out of this. So I really appreciate all of your time that you gave today. Please. My pleasure, buddy. And I'll see you in uh, January down in Florida. I can't wait for that. See you later, man. Have a good one. Hey, everybody. Really quick. I just wanted to let you know that we do this for free. We do this out of the goodness of our heart. And all that we ask of you is just to quickly leave a review if you wouldn't mind. It really helps the algorithm and it helps push this out to a lot more people every time you do that. And if you've already subscribed, that's awesome. Thank you so much. But definitely leave a review. It really, really helps us out. And I know for you guys, it only takes like less than 30 seconds.